Well, hello, everybody. Uh, your last time you have to listen to me, give a welcome. This is our final concluding roundtable of the Yale and Slavery and Historical Perspective um, Conference. Uh, we have assembled a remarkable uh, group of titans uh, who are here on this panel because of their work, both locally, nationally, and in the world, uh, and for their wisdom. Uh, I just want to say a couple things at the outset. We, we are not as quite as cramped for time on this last one as we have been a few other sessions. Um, I'm thinking back to the session uh, late morning about science and medicine, uh, sobering, uh, bracing, uh, disturbing as it is. Um, and I, I couldn't, I wanted to point out then, but I'll just say it now. Frederick Douglass, as many of you know, probably gave a famous speech called The Negro Ethnologically Considered. In uh, 1854, it was his uh, first ever attempt at a, at a kind of college lecture. He was invited, it was at Case Western or what is now Case, then it was called Western Reserve College. And uh, in that speech, he took scientific racism to pieces. He went out and read as this still young abolitionist, uh, the, the major practitioners of uh, race science, uh, Agassiz, Mort, Morton, and many others. And he did a, a, a fairly scholarly demolition of their ideas, uh, you know, well over a century and a half ago, which is very sobering to think about when we realize how all of those ideas revived with such virulence in the 20th century. At the end of that speech, he summed up the work of the race scientists as science, quote, scientific moonshine. Now often that term scientific moonshine gets a smile or a laugh out of audiences and it is a bit funny in a sense, but given what we've learned, and especially after those talks on eugenics here at Yale, uh, it's uh, less funny than it is bracing and sobering to say the least. Now, we're gonna get at this. I'm gonna do relatively quick uh, introductions of my colleagues here. And, uh, and they're all gonna speak for around eight minutes or so, uh, doing summations, wrap ups and provocations about all the ideas that have flowed from our sessions uh, throughout the last uh, two days. Um, first is Craig Stephen Wilder. He's Barton Weller Professor of History at MIT. He's taught many other places, um, at Williams College, Dartmouth College, the New School, and so forth. I think Craig and I first met as, as advisors or consultants or whatever we were on those slavery in New York exhibitions at the New York Historical Society back in the early aughts. But Craig is here, he's written many other books and including a terrific book on, on African-Americans and race in Brooklyn. But he's here primarily because of the book he wrote called Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. Uh, that book has had enormous impact. It's on every reading list about this idea of universities and slavery. And uh, we're gonna make sure it sells some more now, Craig. He's also consulted on lots of documentary films and I wish I had time to uh, uh, say something about all of them. I don't. Anyway, Craig, welcome. Looking forward to hearing from you. James Foreman Jr. is my colleague in the law school. He's the J. Skelly Wright Professor of Law. He attended the public schools of Detroit, Michigan and New York City and Atlanta. And James, we have something in common here. I grew up in the public schools of Flint, Michigan and can claim to be a survivor. Uh, he clerked after Yale Law School. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And uh, after clerking, he became a public defender in Washington, D.C. He helped create or founded um, a charter school uh, called the Maya, An Maya Angelou School, which just had its 20th anniversary. And James's first book, Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America, uh, won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. 
Uh, James has been a member of our working group here on race and slavery and a very valuable member, I must say. Adrian Joy Burns uh, has spent 30 years as a physician's assistant, uh, 16 of those years right here at Yale and the, the Yale Medical Center and particularly at the Smilo Cancer Hospital. Uh, she's been a, a crucial member of our working group. Uh, in fact, many of our Zoom working group meetings, she is usually in her, in her uh, uh, blues and her mask, uh, which she pulls down because she's usually on, on the job at the medical school. Uh, but the reason Joy is on this particular group, the working group and on this panel is that Joy is a, a major voice and activist in the local history of New Haven and, and indeed Connecticut. Uh, she has led many efforts over the last 20 some years to investigate, find, record, and interpret um, the black experience in and around New Haven, including with historic homes and including sites where slaves actually lived. Uh, joy has been, a, 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 shall I say, a joy to get to know in our working group process. Willie James, I introduced uh, yesterday because he chaired our session on religion, but Willie is uh, a professor of systematic theology and Africana studies at the uh, Yale Divinity School. He's the author of several books, but particularly the book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, and the book After Whiteness and Education in Belonging. And as I said yesterday, uh, he's also if he hasn't already about to publish a book of poetry. Uh, he's uh, known um, around Divinity School folks as quite a poet. And if any of you have not had a taste of Willie's uh, lectures on YouTube, you're in for a treat and I strongly urge you to go check them out. Uh, he's also been, of course, a member of our Yale and Slavery Working Group and has been instrumental in helping us get research assistance from within the Divinity School um, universe. Uh, thanks again, Willie. Uh, Kimberly Pinder has just uh, returned to Yale, uh, where she did three degrees, including her PhD. Uh, and she is now the new Stavros Niarchos Foundation Dean of the School of Art uh, here at Yale since just this summer. And uh, she's a uh, uh, curated all sorts of exhibits. Uh, I might just mention a couple. One called Spreading the Gospel, Graffiti in the Public Space as Canvas, and another called Necessary Force, Art of the Police State. Um, her book, Painting the Gospel, Black Public Art and Religion in Chicago, was published in 2016. She is now, uh, as I said, Dean of the Yale Art School, and uh, uh, certainly uh, an important new voice on our campus and how we move forward about all matters of uh, art and memorialization, among other issues. And finally, my colleague, Michael Moran, uh, who has been absolutely crucial to the Yale and Slavery Project. Many on campus know Mike uh, in many uh, uh, elements of his work. He is the uh, Director of Communications at uh, the Beinecke Library. Uh, he's been at, uh, in New Haven since 1983. He's a Yale College graduate. He has an MA in Divinity from the Yale Divinity School. Uh, he serves on all sorts of community uh, boards. He used, to be in the, he used to be an elected member of the City Council of New Haven. Um, and he now works especially with the New Haven Free Public Library and, and many other uh, uh, community projects in this city. And I have discovered and when we started this project that not only are librarians, although Michael always keeps telling me he's not a real librarian, that's not true, but, but the librarians and the people in our libraries are of course absolutely crucial uh, to this project. And uh, frankly, I couldn't be uh, attempting to even uh, chair this project without Mike's help and leadership and uh, deep dives into the archives uh, of, of the Beinecke in particular, but all of Yale's holdings. So uh, Mike, a public thank you to you for uh, everything you've done so far on this project and everything I know you're gonna help do 
all down the road. So let's go right to our speakers, six in a row. Let's dive in. Uh, Craig Wilder, welcome back, and it's all yours. Thank you, David. Um, I'm delighted to join you, and I want to thank you, David, for the work you've been doing to bring this discussion to Yale to the, and the discussion from Yale to the public. Um, my thanks to President Salave for hosting this discussion and for the Gilda Lehrman Center for putting the resources behind really pursuing the topic of Yale's ties to slavery. Um, I think it's actually quite appropriate that Yale be engaged in this discussion in 2021. Um, we've actually kind of come to an interesting um, you know, sort of anniversary of the beginning of this recent discussion. Um, I, let me just say the last 48 hours have been really quite amazing. And so it's difficult to figure out a way to actually synthesize all of the incredible work that's being done. Um, and so what I'd rather do, um, and I'll do some synthesis, but I'd rather do is actually just think some about uh, a suggestion that I have. Um, and it's not just for Yale, it's actually for all of us. One of the things that I think we need to do is start memorializing how we got to this moment. To just really to start thinking about in the broadest intellectual sense, the journey that brought us to 2021, 20 years after Yale rather unintentionally sparked a new interest in the histories of universities ties to slavery um, during its 300th anniversary celebrations in 2001. And if you remember, that's the celebration where um, the um, Yale slavery and abolition website responded to a institutional history that had given Yale quite a bit of credit um, for its contributions to the abolitionist movement. And the website actually pointed out Yale's long ties to slavery, um, the slave economy, and its much deeper history um, with the institution of slavery. And, and in fact, some of the anti-abolitionist activity that had taken place on campus. It seems appropriate that 20 years later, Yale actually hosts a discussion that captures two decades of struggle that have marked the evolution of this debate, um, this question within our institutions. I also think that we need to think about the 50 years that have preceded us, um, 50 years of resistance to change in the modern diversity era of our colleges and universities. That's 50 years of diversity experiments as many of the panelists has pointed, have pointed out on landscapes and across social scapes defined by exclusion and denial. Universities have not, in fact, been welcoming places um, during that period of, um, of diversity, during that period of transformation. Um, both the built environment and the intellectual environment have largely been organized around denying the presences of communities of color. Um, the built environment and the um, intellectual environment has been built around actually and focused on uh, marginalizing those voices, even as those voices, even as those communities were being technically included um, in our broader campus community. If you think about it that way, then in fact, actually the last 20 years have really been quite informative. Um, and there's a real history to be told about what happened. Going back to 2001, the backlash against the graduate students and staff who actually posted the Yale Slavery and Abolition website um, was actually about something that was already known, that American colleges had financial ties to American slavery and political ties to the slaveocracy. In fact, actually, if you look in any of those university libraries, you will find a countless number of books that actually record from the 19th century through the 20th century, the institutional ties to slavery. Um, lots of universities had published histories of themselves, institutional histories, in which they actually recorded their ties to slavery, the presence of enslaved people on campus, the use of enslaved labor to build buildings, um, the use of enslaved labor even in experimentation. The fear in 2001, therefore, was not about the 18th or the 19th century. The fear in 2001, the backlash in 2001, was actually not about slavery. It was actually really about reparations in the present era. It was about actually any, it was a fear of any conversation any discussion that threatened to empower black people and, and people of color to make claims upon historically white institutions. In 2003, when President Ruth Simmons at Brown University um, was, elected, was elected as the new president of Brown University, the public secret of Brown's ties to slavery and the slave trade created a new kind of media swirl. 
and Ruth Simmons' um, extraordinary leadership through that period and the publication of uh, Brown's report, Slavery and Justice in 2006, um, which reported on uh, Brown's historical connections to the slave trade and slavery, actually became a kind of template for a lot of us who were doing that work. Uh, I know for me, as I was actually working on Ebony and Ivy, it was the publication of Slavery and Justice that gave me the sort of will to keep going and to keep researching. Um, but what was also important about um, that project is that President Simmons empowered the committee to bring forth recommendations for restorative and, and compensatory justice. Or in other words, she actually directly tackled the question of reparations. And she crossed what I would describe as one of the red lines in this sort of history of the history of universities and slavery, the recent history of it. There have been lots of red lines. In fact, almost immediately after the Brown Report was um, published, a new red line was sort of drawn. We could admit that universities had ties to slavery, but we were not to suggest that those ties actually mattered. Or the idea was that the American university would not have evolved, would have evolved anyway in the absence of slavery. Um, slavery could financially benefit those institutions. We could actually write about the financial benefits that institutions receive, but it could not have influenced the academic and broader historical importance of those schools. Um, the notion was that even in the absence of slavery, Yale and Princeton and Columbia and Brown and Rutgers and Virginia um, would still have emerged um, and would still have actually had um, similar histories to the ones we know they had. One of the major forces in collapsing that sort of barrier was student activism. And I think the other thing that we need to record in the process of thinking about the last 20 years is the extraordinary work that undergraduate students and, and graduate students have done researching, writing, um, theses, um, course essays that actually, you know, um, student newspaper editorials and articles that have recorded the relationship between their individual campuses and slavery. Um, students actually kept this story going. In many ways, in fact, after Brown published the 2006 report, one of the striking things on the institutional level was the almost complete silence of Brown's peer institutions. There was no report from the other Ivy, reports from the other Ivy League institutions and the broader community of schools that actually have these historical ties. Um, what filled that space was student activism, was student research, was undergraduate and graduate school projects. The other um, thing we should remember is uh, archivists and librarians actually began posting um, exhibits on institutional ties to slavery. Um, one of the first ones I saw was down at William and Mary where the archivist had actually put up in the um, entryway to the archive, a really quite fascinating exhibit on some of the early material um, related to slavery in the college archives. Broader student activism, including the Occupy movement and the Black Lives Matters movement were recently also started to weaponize this history to challenge the racial cultures of our current campus communities. Or in other words, student activism actually kept this topic alive it kept us actually talking about, thinking about, and forced us um, not to abandon the discussion of how universities actually benefited from, profited from, and were transformed by enslavement. In 2016, when Georgetown actually um, publicly declared, announced its historical ties to slavery, and in particular actually looked at the 1838 sale of 272 people from the Jesuits Maryland plantations into Louisiana, a sale that actually helped to pay off the debts of Georgetown University and to expand Catholic higher education um, in the United States. Um, for example, shortly after that sale, um, the Jesuits established Holy Cross, which is the first Catholic university in New England and Fordham, the first Catholic university in um, the mid-Atlantic in New York. Um, and one of, the, one of the important things that came out of that is actually, if you remember, um, the Georgetown sale also, or the or Georgetown discussion, also actually returns the question of reparations as a central theme to this work. Or because Georgetown is the only of the college or university established before 1800 that maintains its religious ties, one of the things that happened with the Georgetown um, announcement was that Georgetown actually dealt publicly with the moral problem of its history. The return of reparations was in fact an important transformation because it actually again excited a new wave of student and undergraduate activism. One of the other major changes has been the renewed push to examine the history of universities um, beyond uh, slavery, 
to really take slavery and think about it as a global institution or an institution that actually helped to create a global financial and economic community. Um, my personal sense of this is actually goes a little bit further. Um, I actually think that one of the things we've learned in the last 20 years is the importance of being open, honest, and brutally um, honest about the history of slavery on our campuses and the history of our university's ties to slavery. But it is equally incumbent upon us to not allow African-American history or the history of African-American slavery to um, be used to evade the obligation to examine Native American history and the histories of other marginalized communities that trace their roots and trace their past across the very same campuses, across the very same communities, across the very same spaces and through the very same archives. Um, the publication last year, for instance, of Landgrab University, the extraordinary investigation of the um, role that the land grant universities and the seizure of Native American lands played in the expansion of American higher education actually really in many ways reveals how important this moment is. Um, we need to actually use this moment to record our own journey, but also actually to connect that journey um, to the struggles of other communities who are looking to also understand the way in which their histories tie in to the history of, histories of our universities. Um, just in their earlier session, um, one of the Yale students, Denasia Gray's excellent description of Yale's campaign against the Negro College in New Haven in 1831, perfectly underscored the logic of bringing these histories into dialogue. Um, that very year, 1831, as she was speaking, I remember that James Kent, a graduate of Yale, um, who went on to become a, a, a Supreme Court Justice in New York, um, and a major figure in the establishment of the legal profession across the United States and the professionalization of the law across the United States. Um, that year, James Kent came to the commencement that happened right after the destruction of the Negro College plan. He came to Yale's commencement to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Phi Beta Kappa. And he used both the backdrop of the destruction of the Negro College and the celebration of Yale's commencement, the launching of the $100,000 fundraising campaign to actually commemorate and celebrate the destruction of Native American nations and to confine the remaining indigenous communities of New England to the past, or in other words, to create and write a new history of Yale at that moment that was consistent with his vision of the United States, a racially exclusive vision of the United States. Um, and so one of the things I'd like us to do as we actually move forward with our campus campaigns and the research that we're doing on our institutions is also actually as the students are beginning to do and really have done it, uh, demonstrated the importance of to connect those histories to a much larger story that will forever change the way we think about not just Yale, but the rise of higher education in the past and the future of higher education for us all. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Craig. That's a great start. And, and to end on that, I, to end on that James Kent speech is amazing. I'm not Sure, we knew about that, but Mike Moran probably does. Uh, uh, that's remarkable, to say the least. Uh, thank you. And uh, so, James Foreman, over to you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who's worked on this conference. Um, I, you know, never really look forward to an online conference. I'm not going to lie. Um, but this one has, I think, really been exceptional in so many ways. Um, from the from the organization to the presentations, the speakers, the the playlist. Um, yes, yeah, somebody said please post post the playlist again. I already I asked for the playlist. I have it. I've liked it on Spotify. I encourage other people to do the same. Uh, it's been a really really uh, terrific panel, and I'm 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 honored to be part of the offer some closing remarks. Um, you know, when I was coming up uh, to my room to do this call, my son, who who wanted me to be downstairs uh, playing with him, he was like, why are you going to speak about this slavery in Yale conference? He's been asking about this for the last couple of days. He was like, don't doesn't everybody know that there were slaves um, that helped build Yale? And, you know, I thought about his, you know, his question I thought was is so important um, because 
Um, one, of course, not everybody knows, and there's been a lot of denial, um, but also even those of us who know, uh, don't know, don't know the details and don't know whole topics. I know for myself, I'm taking away from this conference in particular, the presentations by uh, Bennett Parton uh, and uh, Denisha Gray about the uh, Negro College in 1831. Um, there's something about the story of Yale University using its its heft and its might and its alumni and it and its alums in the city and its leaders, including one of the founders of the law school, taking a stance against the possibility of building a college for Black students. Um, that, especially given the supposed mission of a university that 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 just it, it haunts me and it's been haunting me for the last um, two or three days. So as I think about you know closing up a uh, a, a, a conference like this one, when I'm thinking about both the work that's been done and the work that lies ahead, and it feels to me like there are the the work falls into some 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 buckets, right? We have the task of of, of learning this history. And when I say we, I, I, this is in part because I'm a member of the committee, um, as, as David mentioned, we, we have the task of studying and learning this history. We have the, the task of publishing this history. We have the task of, of commemorating in very public uh, and accessible ways um, this history. And then we collectively have the task of, of responding and, and repairing and atoning for uh, this history. And I think all of those are present challenges. I think the one that I'm the most confident about being done very well is the studying and the learning of the history. And I think the one that I'm the most worried about, that I'm the least confident about, is this question of response uh, and repair. And so in my closing comments, I just want to challenge us not to let that slip. I want to challenge us to, to lead and to force Yale to lead where for so long a uh, Yale has, has followed or has resisted. I mean, in her opening remarks, Elizabeth Alexander told us, you know, it's wonderful that this conference is now. And it's too late that it's now. Right? And, and, and Dean Nelson, uh, Risa Nelson asked, in reference to the, the Negro College proposal, she said, at a, a lunchtime uh, panel, she said, what would New Haven have looked like? Right? What would Connecticut have looked like? What would the nation have looked like if Yale had used its power and its resource to lead for Black education in this city, right? rather than to defeat it? And we can't do anything right now today about choices and decisions that were made in 1831. But we can, should, and must absolutely do something about decisions that are made in 2021. So I want to ask us to focus ourselves now and in the months and years to come on the question of slavery and its afterlives and to ask and demand that Yale use all of its creative and intellectual and financial resources to respond, to repair, to compensate, to atone for the history that is being uncovered as we speak. And I don't know, I don't have all the answers for what that looks like, but I can say I'm, I'm gonna be the faculty director of a a new center that's being started here on campus, Center for Law and Racial Justice, uh, it's launching in January. Uh, and what I can do is I can offer myself and I can offer that center uh, as eager participants in the conversation about, again, that last piece of the story, that, that repair and compensate and atone and redress. You know, Craig Wilder tells us that Ruth Simmons crossed a red line when she opened up a conversation about repair and recompense. 
So I just want to say that I want to be among those who crosses that red line here in New Haven and here at Yale. Thank you. Uh, James, thank you. And that, that just prompts me to, to say that like this new justice center you're creating, there are many, as you know, I mean, there are many institutes, centers and elements of Yale's education and outreach. The GLC is one of them. I and mean, part of our motto at the GLC is to do what, what a Yale can do best, which is create knowledge and teach, but to, to take it out of our campus, out of here, off the campus, out in the world, uh, and then to bring the world here. Uh, there, there's so many parts of Yale already doing that in one way or another on this subject and that subject and that subject, but my God, if we could ever harness all of that energy. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. So, uh, Joy Burns, you're next. Tell us some of the great work you've been up to in and around New Haven for so long. Welcome, Joy. Thank you. So, um, I I, I feel like I need to change my talk because David gave us so much permission to bring heat. Um, but I'm going to start off with my great great grandmother, who was born in uh, South Carolina and was an enslaved person. And when I did research about her in Charleston, South Carolina, I was actually able to go and see a slave market. And um, Daniel, could you show my slide about Lucy Triton, please? Um, yeah. um, yes, thank you. Unlike in New Haven, where you cannot go to a spot and see the place where Lucy Triton was sold as an enslaved person. In 1825 was when the last sale of an enslaved person occurred in New Haven. And it was Lucy Triton. And it was on the New Haven Green. Many of us have stood at a certain bus stop at Temple and um, Chapel. Uh, and it is very close to that bus stop that is the place where Lucy Triton was sold into slavery. Um, this is her emancipation paperwork. And actually what occurred was she was sold into slavery and then virtually immediately she was um, manumitted and given this paperwork stating that she is for free. She was free. And it reads, know all men by these presents that I, Anthony P. Sanford of the city and county of New Haven, in consideration of a valuable sum of money received to my full satisfaction of Lucy Triton, a female colored slave belonging to me, do hereby release and forever quit claim to her, the said Lucy, all the rights and title which I have or ought to have to her and her services and hereby emancipate and set her free. So what would it be like in the city and on the Yale campus if all of this history that we've been talking about the last couple of days were set free? What would it be like if it was visible and honest, if we were able to educate, engage, atone, and gather together as members of the city, as members of the, of the staff of the university, and as students, um, long-term community members, if we were all able to gather together and talk about this history and bring it into the visible space. When you walk around New Haven, you don't see a colonial city. You don't see a place that indigenous people lived in. And you certainly don't see the presence and the creation of all of those African-Americans who contributed so much to the creation of Yale University and to New Haven. It's kind of challenging because there's the past and then there's the recent present. There's Corey Menifee taking that broom to destroy that window in Calhoun College. 
there's 2015 and all of the unrest on campus as this as the students of color were challenged and were calling people out for wearing blackface and wearing Indian dre uh, dresses um, in Halloween costumes and being called snowflakes for being overly sensitive. Um, there's the recent petitions in the last couple of years by the students of the medical school and of the Yale School of Nursing, the petitions that ask to be seen, to be noticed, to be treated and have their humanity acknowledged and to not be treated like they're different, to be treated like their white peers. This morning I went and I took a walk through Grove Street Cemetery and I visited the graves of Sylvia Arden Boone and John Blassingame and Benoit Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot because he created this math that's fractals and that kind of explodes and makes things bigger. And because I know that Blassingame and Boone, if they were here today on this committee, they would be saying, bring this into visual space, make this history known, bring it to a place where anyone, anyone in the world actually can Google uh, Alexander Dubois, can Google Charles McLean and find out about their history in this city. Bring it, make it visible, bring the truth and reconciliation that all of us need to heal. Um, and actually, no, I'm sorry, Pat Willard, who's asking, are there slides that are talking about this? And the answer to that is unfortunately no. And that's because I changed my talk just before we went on because of the permission that David Blake gave us. Um, but I will, I will give some of this information to be posted in the post conference notes. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to wait and hold the rest of my comments until um, after everybody else is presented. But certainly, um, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you, Amistad Committee, for always bringing the heat. Well, Joy, thank you. I, I for one, know you have much more to say. And so dive right back in later. Um, I wasn't aware I gave everybody permission to bring the heat, but I assumed that's what you all would do. So anyway, <laughs> uh, Professor Willie Jennings, you are uh, next up, sir. Thank you so much, David. I want to echo what others have said in thanking you for your brilliant leadership and also Michelle Zacks for her extraordinary work in helping to pull this together. This has been an extraordinary experience, an extraordinary uh, work of a conference uh, that has done so much important work already. For me, it has been a shining example of what it means to lead in the ethics of remembering, how to remember, how to make visible the invisible, and how to allow that visibility to do the important work that it must do at a university. I think the crucial question that uh, this conference has brought to me is how do we move this work of remembering? How do we move this work of making visible that which is invisible into the pedagogical imagination of this school? How might we take this beyond just the work, the important work of historians, but more than the work of historians, how do we bring this into the full work of teaching and research in the university? As you all know, this is, this is the work that we're in the center of. And I think we are also now clearly in the center of a kind of intellectual reparations that has to happen. A way of bringing the discussion of slavery into areas of research and scholarship that imagine that they are uh, allowed to be freed from these crucial questions. I think everyone knows who's listening to this today, I think everyone knows that we are in the midst in this country of a tremendous struggle between the relationship of remembering and teaching. 
And Yale plays a crucial role, I think, in helping to do the connecting between a proper remembering, a deep remembering, and the work of teaching. But I think it has to begin uh, here at Yale in a new way. And what this conference has done for me is to show that we have a lot of work to do ahead of us in order to have an ethics of remembering really shape the pedagogical work of this university. The other thing that um, has come become clear to me through this conference, and this obviously touches on my own area, and that is the importance of Christianity at the very heart of this university. And that, that uneasy but important relationship between Christianity, whiteness, education, and the American psyche. I think at this moment, being able to think very carefully and clearly about that relationship is so important. We are living right now in the continuing afterlife of that relationship, the afterlife of a Christianity and a whiteness and a desire to have a particular vision of civilization. And so the, I think the lesson that we must take is that we have to take Christianity seriously, not simply as a kind of historical launching pad for, Christ, for uh, Yale, and nor as just a kind of set of uh, religious problems that we have to overcome, but as a way of understanding the continuing struggles and difficulties of the American psyche and the problems of whiteness. And so I think there's much that we have gained from the conference and I'm looking forward to the work that we're going to do that builds from what we've done already. I'll stop right there because I have more to say, but I too want to have a, be a part of the conversation. Well, thanks, Willie. Uh, you uh, surprised me there in your brevity, but, but that's okay. <laughs> you, you'll be coming back, I know that. Uh, and now over to Dean Kimberly Pinder. Dean Pinder. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, let's see, I have a lot of things open here. Okay. Good afternoon. I feel very fortunate that I have returned to Yale just in time for this conference to be a part of it. And I hope, really hope, to meet many uh, more of these new colleagues that I'm seeing a lot on Zoom, um, meeting them in person. In the last three days, I have learned so much about the extensive work that Yale faculty, students, and staff have been doing to engage fully in what President Holloway called, in opening remarks, historical honesty. I wanted to return as Dean of the School of Art to join other change agents at an institution that shaped my own scholarship through a rigorous learning environment in which I learned about empowerment, Yale's and my own, as well as absences, Yale's and my own. I wanted to just list a few phrases that I've been capturing over the last few days. And these I'm just putting in there, I'm not gonna quote People, I'm hoping that people will be like, oh, yes, Elizabeth Alexander said that. And oh, yes, um, James said that. But, um, and these will frame my brief discussion of one reparative process um, centered on a mural that I worked on at a former institution. So I feel like I'm presenting here, one of my charges was to figure out how can art, for instance, move us forward. So here are some of those phrases, and I hope you all are noting that you heard them. Social and spaces justice are linked. Apology markers, aspiration reportage, importantly evergreen. Process is more important than product, black art futures, medical racism, necessary in humanity, seduced by the archive, ambient images of blackness and race, messy and dense networks, pale male and Yale, embodied stories, bringing the heat, and we just heard ethics of remembering. I was struck by a comment Elizabeth Alexander made 
regarding her living with the Yale portrait as a student, the one that we've spent a lot on, the, the Yale, LEU Yale portrait, as a student and faculty member. And when she actually saw it, she said, when I noticed it, it was a crisis. And I feel that that really also helps frame where we are in time right now. Imagery in public spaces has a responsibility and an effect that other works of art just do not. They often shape space for viewers without their consent. And I think we're on the first slide, right? Um, in spring 2018, I co-taught a course entitled Community Arts Practice, the Zimmerman Library, Library Three Murals, I'm sorry, Three People's Murals. And this was at the University of New Mexico, where I was the Dean of Fine Arts um, between 2012 and 2018. The year before, a group, of, a group of staff members from the library at the university filed a hostile work environment complaint concerning the mural that you see here. Kenneth Adams, a white American artist from Kansas who had relocated to, Mex to New Mexico was commissioned to create these murals, which are oil paintings installed in the walls niches. And they were, he was asked to represent the relationship among the three prominent racial groups in the state at that time in the 1930s. Next slide, please. Just making sure I can see what, what's going on. Um, okay, and next slide. Yes, this gives you an example of the type of work that he usually did. The new library was being built by the architect John Gamin in Pueblo revival style, creating the core aesthetic of the campus that is still very prominent today. The murals were installed in 1939. The murals were the source of protests and complaints almost immediately and continued to be in, in significant protests, the subject of them in the 1970s, 1990s, through the 2000s, the 2010s, and most recently at the core subject um, in 2020 of a change.org petition requesting the removal of the murals. In response to the library staff complaint, the associate in 2018, the associate provost and American studies professor Alex Lubin created a task force. I was on it. I offered to reshape a class that I often teach on the history of murals to provide solutions in the same vein as the many courses as we have seen that are being offered here at Yale. Next slide, please. Sorry. Here's a description of the course to give you an idea of what students understood they were in for. Uh, the 1939 Three People's Murals in the library have a rich and controversial presence at UNM. This interdisciplinary class explores the many issues surrounding art in public places. Students from multiple disciplines will delve into critical issues related to the impact of public art on communities through discussion, research, collaboration, and problem solving. What is public art's responsibility to its audiences? Guest speakers and faculty from departments across campus will also contribute. The class also had an online section, included 33 speakers, two lead faculty, two teaching assistants, and 64 students on multiple campuses. The course lectures, readings, and assignments use the mural as a window into much more than the six disciplines for which students could receive credit. Topics range from historic preservation to indigenous rights in New Mexico's history of statehood to Chicano liberation studies. Lectures were often conversations and presentations in panel formats with historians, preservationists, conservators, sociologists, psychologists, college administrators, campus planners, city public art officials, muralists, architects. It was also important in this class to hear from actual artists. And this is an image that you're seeing here um, I brought a number of um, muralists of color into conversation, such as Nani Chacon, a Diné and Chicana painter, 
who has created many murals globally and many also in New Mexico. As this one here that I photographed while she was making it. Next slide, please. Back to the murals. I just want to, I hope you can see, I know probably many of you may be looking at this on a small screen, but this is a conflation of um, all four panels together. And I hope you can make out, I'm not going to do an in-depth formal analysis, but you can see that the three groups are represented. Um, one, indigenous people as craftsmen and women and um, be Hispanic, and that is how they characterize themselves in New Mexico, the Hispanic population as agricultural, and the white population as scientific. And then the final panel, you'll see there is this very Aryan image, remember this from 1939, um, of a white man who is centralized, and the other men um, are holding his hand and facing him, and they do not have any eyes. This class was open to the public and included an evening lecture series. All lectures were recorded and posted on UNM's website. We also hosted it at noon in a very large um, lecture area, and it was an open invitation for anyone to join the conversation. This course became, as it developed and the students really engaged in it, as I feel many of the um, engagements that are happening on the Yale campus. This one in particular became one site on campus and an important site for transparency, interdisciplinarity, resistance, catharsis, anger, shame, trauma, and sorrow. Also repair and imagining and imaging a com compassionate futures. Unfortunately, those 2018 students left campus with the murals still in place and with no definitive answer as to the result of their efforts. And their efforts were the final project. They all were in these interdisciplinary groups and they created proposals that were sent directly to the president. And that was also part of their charge in the class. More student, let, um, you can do the next slide, please. More student led activism, revived their projects recently. And the retractable scrims that were mentioned in many of these 2018 students' proposals were actually installed just a couple of months ago. I will end by quoting Barbara Earl Thomas, who I thoroughly enjoyed her presentation. And she said this, Grace, is that moment between event and response. And I like this segue here from the blank panels that you see there at the University of New Mexico. That is where we are right now at, on the Yale campus as well. Barbara Earl Thomas, her discussion of her stained glass panels for Hopper College and other work that she has created tend, tended to focus on the word even in the titles Mending. Mending what is broken was one title. Mending alludes to fixing, but not replacing. Stitches, glue, brackets, tape, still visible. The trauma is not completely erased because it cannot be, but it is always in the background and that is real and it is okay. She also mentioned about let's move forward, make mistakes and forgive each other. <laughs> As my colleague Cheryl Finley has proven in her extensive body of work and her presentation, images such as that of the slave ship carry a cruel and persistent indelibility. And artists can harness that power by creating their own. It is my hope that the incredible energy and interest around community engaged practices of many of Yale's art students and alumni, many current ones, as you also saw in some of our presentations, will be an active part of this essential and evergreen process for Yale. Thank you very much.
And thank you, Kimberly. You had about seven or eight of those key phrases. I couldn't write them down fast enough. Yeah. So I can paste recording. them in the in the chat. No worries, no worries. We're recording this. Actually, it's a very valuable thing you did there. I just also wondered what a wonderful uh, chance you had there to bring back Barbara Thomas's uh, talk. Uh, she was the artist speaking about her work, but people may have missed this. But she even uh, talked about how she wanted to make sure that somehow the old Calhoun story wasn't fully erased. Right. And she uh -huh. did it, even in the, the work. And I, I just wanted to point out that one of our three principles that we came up with on this Calhoun renaming committee that I was on, was it five years ago now or six? I forget. One of them was non-erasure. I'm sure Barbara was told that. You know, there, there was a principle that if you change, you replace, but don't entirely erase because then too much forgetting can occur. I just found that interesting and you just pointed that out and I just remembered that. So thank you. Uh, and finally, okay, uh, Michael Moran uh, of the Beinecke Library, uh, your wrap up and provocative thoughts, um, Mr. Moran. Thank you so much, David. And special thanks to the indefatigable and tenacious Michelle uh, Zacks and to Daniel Vieira, who are doing so much behind the scenes. Thank you to both of you comrades for such incredible labor on uh, this conference and everything about the Yale and Slavery Working Group. I am a graduate of the Yale Divinity School, so I hope it's okay that I bring in some scripture I uh, frankly did better in homiletics than hermeneutics, so I might preach more than I analyze. But the texts I have are a contemporary one from uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King on April 3rd, 1968. And then a text from a book that in some ways, as uh, Dr. Jennings and I would know, is a founding text, the Bible. Uh, this, of course, is from Micah, the sixth chapter in the eighth verse. And uh, it's admonition, which I will hopefully take myself to walk humbly, that we all might all love kindness as one translation would have it, but most importantly for us and our provocation to our institution, that it be true to what is said on the paper of its founding text, which is to do justice. I wanna dedicate these remarks to two of my greatest mentors, Portland Seymour Wilson and Ruth Herb Wilson, two of the great centurions, black activists and truth tellers of this city who I was privileged to learn from and be friends with. Uh, they are in that great legacy of Adam Clayton Powell Sr., Bias Stanley and others that Frank Mitchell brought into our conversation yesterday. And I am blessed to uh, count Frank as uh, someone who I share life with and count him as one of those truth tellers he and I both also count and take inspiration from one of New Haven's greatest, the daughter of Cortland Seymour Wilson and Ruth Herb Wilson, our fellow Yale alum, Ruthie Gilmore Wilson, a voice and uh, activist who tells the truth and leads and we can all learn from in this and other endeavors. I love this story from October 1967 of Cortland picketing solo in front of the president's house charging, as it says, Eli employment apartheid. Cortland at the time worked at Yale. And I like this image because it reminds us of the power of even one person who speaks truth to power. And it reminds us that workers are at the heart of this story. And I wanna thank Dr. Wilder for reminding us that students and workers have been the ones who have kept faith in this process as in so many and to uphold with others Corey Menefee's role in 2015 and that of the graduate students and their colleagues in Yale's unions and the Amistad Committee in 2001. I also wanna uphold the long legacy of those who keep in, hold institutions to account. And this is a slide of a memorial that probably very few people know. You've probably passed by and I've actually enhanced it so it's legible because its designer told me that he was told by the institution to make it as hard to see as possible. 
but it's a permanent memorial to efforts that I was privileged to be part of with many others on campus and throughout town in solidarity with the people of South Africa. I encourage people to try and find it, particularly contemporary students. And when you do, tag me on Instagram so that I know that you've seen it. The invisibility of some markers is all the more glaring and telling in the presence of so many markers. Our institution intensely celebrates itself and marks itself, not its full self, but we all know the marks are everywhere. And this is an extraordinary deluxe book of every possible kind of mark in the Memorial Quadrangle, Brantford and Saybrook College as we know them now, including a statue of John Calhoun still on the Carillon. This is the sum total in its hundreds of pages and tens of thousands of words about the people who built, and it is important. And I, I uh, want to thank Mary Miller for pointing this out to me first, the great historian. It notes that three people were killed in the construction in 1916-17. And you will see here, and it says, quote, they were just common laborers and their names are of no consequence. It was this was written in 1929, and I want to bring uh, the words that Daniel Hosang mentioned in a previous talk uh, related to the subject, pulling in Dr. Du Bois, that folks writing things like they were just common laborers and their names of no consequence should have known better. What that says is, as in the words of Dr. Du Bois, unworthy of grown folks. We need to rewrite the history. I also want to bring in this from Yale College's sketch of its history, which notes correctly that Yale College is the growth of the soil of New Haven. But what we've seen in this conference, and what we need to remember, is that like the nation, New England, Connecticut, and New Haven, Yale is, of course, the growth of racial capitalism, indigenous land dispossession, and wealth from enslaved labor. We need to refresh our geography. This was just a quick infographic I did last night that notes all of the black people enslaved and or free who lived, worked and worshiped in New Haven circa 1748 and in the 18th century who were mentioned just in this conference in the last 46 hours. Of course, if we mapped everyone, this is what black space in reality in terms of the contributions of black people free and enslaved to this community New Haven and Yale. In other words, the map is the map of what, where Black people lived and the contributions they made so often without recompense, reward, or recognition. We need to refresh our geography. We need to tell their stories, find their names, know their names, say their names, and honor their lives. As we have seen in this conference, and as a number of people have noted, these are stories that are not exactly hidden, but it's rather they're not fully seen, not fully showcased. Connecticut Hall is at the beginning of every Yale tour. It was the stamp at the Yale Tercentennial, the first place put on the National Historic uh, uh, Register. The 1831 college, the plans we've been able to find were meant to be, and as was noted by Danasia, at East and Wallace Streets, I credit my colleague Alvin Ashete of the School of Art for helping dig this out. That's underneath where the current intersection of 91 and 95 is. Not exactly a hidden spot. And of course, the Civil War Memorial is one of the most trafficked places on campus. So it's past time for us to know, share, and pass on the story. This is a museum label in town about the West Indian trade that doesn't mention enslaved people. It is past time to know, share, and pass on the full story. To do that on campus with the community, to do it in the curriculum, to make sure that Black studies are central, integral, essential, funded, supported, and celebrated as a department with autonomy and integrated into the entire curriculum throughout the campus in perpetuity, and then funded, supported, and celebrated more. It's important that we have memorials, memorializations, 
And I would note one thing we can do very quickly is change the campus tour to make it right on site and online. And we might want, as many have said, a sort of inspector general for institutional history. This work is not one and done. Dr. Wilder noted the importance of doing continued work in indigenous land dispossession. And we're just beginning to uncover things here related to that. As Joy has said, we need to do this in the community as well. We need to do it on the green, in the cemeteries, in the parks, in the schools, in the libraries, wherever it had happened. And the reality is it happened everywhere. And I would hold up for us, let's create a New Haven history network. The nation will celebrate its 250th birthday in 2026. Let us make sure that the full story of New Haven is being told and continues to be told. I also want to share these words of truth on paper, calling out the nation for its hypocrisy and calling out the nation to be true to what it said on paper from a New Havener, William Grimes. I put a link in the chat to the life of William Grimes and want to shout out his great, great, great granddaughter, Regina Mason, who's done so much to recover, discover, and share this story, one that I hope all of us will get to know just as we're getting to know the story of Connecticut Hall and so much more. So let me close just by saying again, let us call on ourselves and our institution to be true to what is said on paper. For those of us in leadership in this place, in this institution, let us have humility, not triumphalism. I think I can do that. Let us have history, not hagiography. And most importantly, let us make sure, as everyone has said leading up uh, to this final panel, let us make sure that real work is done and that we do justice. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, for that, uh, uh, as usual, Augustinian appeal for both humility and knowledge. I've come to expect that from you. Great work, partner. Um, I just want to quickly point to something Willie said, and I have a quick quote, and then I'm going to just challenge everybody here with a question to get us moving. Willie mentioned the ethics of memory. One of those phrases, it's a great phrase. And as Willie knows, and many of us here probably know, there's a huge literature on this. There's actually a book by that title, The Ethics of Memory. It's by a great uh, Israeli philosopher named Avishai Magalit. And in it, he says this, it can be a little bit of a motto for us, if you like. Why ought humanity remember moral nightmares? I'm quoting, rather than moments of human triumph, moments in which human beings behaved nobly. And he goes on. He says, of course, there is something good and endearing in us humans all over the world remembering such glorious events and the people who were involved in them. But the issue for us to sort out is what humanity ought to remember rather than what it is good for humanity to remember. There's a simplicity in that, but there's a power in that. We shouldn't just remember what it feels good to remember. We should remember what we ought to remember. Uh, that's what's hard about it, though, isn't it? That's why this is so hard. Uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, universities, we all kind of know this, and we live it. Universities exist today, anyway, ours surely does, to advance humane values, humane letters, humane sciences. We are about enlightenment. We know we are. We believe that. We are about progress. Who doesn't want to believe in progress? We're about pursuit of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge. We're about these ideals and the missions and our mission statements. Uh, and we should embrace that in my view. We should never back away from that with sim by simply being ironic about that. There's nothing ironic about these values. They're real and we live them or we wouldn't be all be here today doing this. We should be proud of that in my humble view. But what we've 
talked about here for three days now is the deep paradox, the deep irony, the deep contradictions in our own history of these very ideals. To all of you on the panel, your thoughts on that. This is a history. We, we, we all work on this history. We do it every day. Some of us have done it all of our lives. Um, and yet we equally believe in all of the, and I could go on with another list of those, the belief in reason, belief in rationality, and so on. How do we keep balancing the story we're trying to uncover here and tell of the world with these values we live every day? Thoughts. Willie, you want to go first on that one? David, thank you. And I, I love very much the way you've summarized what for some could be seen as a dilemma. But, but we have to remember that we are inside of a longer story. It is, it is the story, as you pointed out so nicely, the story of a certain kind of enlightenment that we imagine that we're inside of. And that story of enlightenment is tied also with a story of terror. And so the challenge is to, to see both stories as something we're working inside of. And as we're working inside of it, we're, we're engaged in a kind of exorcism, aren't we? The, to exorcise, um, to use that theological language, to exorcise the demons that have lurked on the other, underside of that enlightenment. The demons that have lurked inside the greed and the theft that made possible, as um, Dr. Wilder mentioned so beautifully in his comments, that made possible um, the space of the university. And it's, it's exactly understanding both theft and gift <laughs> that have been so woven together, the stealing from and the offering to that we have to hold together. And I think for so many universities and, and so much of education in, in this country, uh, we, we do really well at remembering the gift <laughs> of education and so forth. We don't do very well of, of understanding the theft. And how might we take both gift and theft and allow ourselves to think deeply, ethically, morally at the very center of both gift and theft, such that we don't live in the illusion that it's all just gift. It's all just triumphal gift, but not also the horror and the screams and the cries of theft. And the way we do that is we turn the gift of education, the, the gift of reason and of thinking and of enlightenment and of freedom and of speech, we turn all those gifts toward rectifying what was taken with theft so that we don't use gift to further theft. And that's, that's the danger of not taking seriously slavery. That's the danger of not taking seriously slavery as a crucial place of intellectual work across the university, whether one is in history or calculus, whether one is in religion or chemistry, thinking seriously about the ongoing afterlife of slavery is crucial to all our intellectual work. And so I think what's so important for this moment, especially here at Yale, is for us to see the expansion of the moral, the moral reality of this work that we are in the midst of. Well, thank you, Willie. Uh, others, take a crack. James, Craig, Joy, anyone? <laughs> Willie, did Willie say it all? I don't know. <laughs> he he certainly came close. I, I I think you scared the rest of us away from oh, him. I, I <laughs> Let the preachers go first. It's all over. Right? Yeah, no, no, no one wants to follow a preacher, especially a historian. Yeah, the, the, you know, I think once you get into the ethics of mora of uh, memory and of remembering and the the very act of trying to remember, um, you know, you've already entered into a a moral space. Um, I, you know, I think the, the challenge for us is actually the, the power of rendering things forgotten. And universities have a disproportionate power 
to take things that are known and actually make them unspeakable, mm. um, to remove them from the public realm. And I, my suspicion is that one of the reasons why universities have been such a lightning rod over the past 20 years for the study of slavery is exactly because they exercise that disproportionate power over the public sphere, um, over what we discuss and how we discuss it. There's an intentionality to forgetting things. Um, there's an intentionality to the social process of forgetting. Um, you know, I was shocked when I first started doing this work, you know, because I thought I was going to, I was starting this big uphill climb, and I was in ways, but you know, my first introduction was just going into the library at Dartmouth mm. and putting all the books about universities, um, the university histories on a big table, and I started reading through them, looking for mentions of slavery, and what shocked me was how many mentions of slavery there were. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, how, how little we actually discuss that. And so, you know, I, I actually take a different um, lesson from this. It, you know, when I first started doing this work, I was angry that we hadn't actually had this discussion, um, that uh -huh. we, we weren't doing this. Yeah, I was, I, I was outraged that universities with massive history departments and these ties to slavery had not actually already done this work. Um, but today, I actually think about it quite differently. I look over the past 20 years and the past 50 years, as I tried to outline in my talk, and I actually think about the way in which this conversation in particular has validated the struggles of faculty of color, students of color, communities of color, um, employees, black and brown on our campuses to build, make more livable communities to actually have their presences acknowledged, not just to be included, but actually to make these institutions transform because of our presence. Um, and that has been a, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the way in which you know, this conversation right now actually really validates many of those struggles, the, the struggles of their allies to be supportive. Um, mm -hmm. And when I think about the changing landscape of the American college, the, literally the, the changing visual and built environment of the American college today, and I think about the conversations that we're now having about the histories of universities so that we can't return to the old story anymore. Yeah. It's not available to us anymore. Um, what's so powerful about that is the way that it, has, it validates the extraordinary work that people did on our campuses to make these spaces um, at least slightly more honest mm -hmm. about the world that they occupy and how they've occupied that world. Well, thank you. Uh, I see Joy and then Mike. Uh, Joy, go ahead and go first. <laughs> um, I think the thing that struck me was I, I immediate, who, the person who immediately came to mind was Natalia Braginsky and her students. Mm -hmm. um, Natalia recently won a Teacher of the Year Award from the right. Guild of Lerman Institute. And um, her students have created these podcasts and walking tours. And there's something so honest and um, that comes across when you take the walks and when you listen to them talk about their experience of New Haven and their experience of how they were able to learn all this history and to bring it forward. Um, and so can we find creative ways, perhaps now that the Q house, house is open again, to bring all this history to the community, to have dialogues and interactions, um, to create art, um, public art, and in all kinds of spaces all over the city that engages lots of different groups of people and draws them into a discussion about this history. You've done some of that, right, Joy, with, with seeking out all these houses where slaves actually live. Do you want to just name that program at least and then people can look it up? Um, so there's the Witness Stones. Um, yeah that uh, was created by Dennis Culloden. And um, I did a project with Dennis out at the Pardee Morris house. One of my slides actually was of some witness stones that we put in with young people from the Cole, Cole Spring School and from the Foot School um, in June of this year of, um, that are stones about the enslaved people who actually lived at those houses. Um, and so that's one of the things is to bring that to New Haven. Um, Connecticut Hall is not a space that's accessible to the community. You know, it's within Phelps Gate. And, the, yeah. and so can we put 
things into public spaces or on Chapel Street or Church Street or College that invites anybody to interact with it at, at any time of the day. Um, and so it would be wonderful to see Witness Stones on Chapel Street about Connecticut Hall. I'm just going to put that plug in there. Well, you know, and, and we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A all about this question of what, what, what will Yale do with plaques or markings and so on and so forth. Well, the answer is we don't know exactly yet, but there's a lot of possibilities of all kinds. And that certainly is going to be part of this project down the road. Michael, go ahead. I was thinking about the line uh, that Gore Vidal, who's a problematic character, but nonetheless had a great line calling our country the United States of amnesia. And uh, I know somebody who wrote a book called Race and Reunion that was about amnesia. And we all know we're living through a time uh, that's because enough. of the amnesia, uh, we're facing the problems we face. And so what Dr. Wilder said about uh, uh, this process, I think really resonates with me. And we can model for ourselves uh, and for our students by this critical reckoning uh, against uh, amnesia. And hopefully that will have ongoing uh, resonances out into the world by the young people that we educate in the institutions. And I also was thinking, you know, in this, um, to, to go back to scripture, the stone that the builder rejected has become the yeah. cornerstone. And that really is what this is about. The margins uh, were not really margins. They were at the center, but they've been cast to the margin. We all will be free only when that's put at the center and made the cornerstone. And Joy and I are both people who love Grove Street Cemetery, involved with it in various ways. And interestingly enough, when you walk in now, the prime real estate is occupied by Du Bois's grandfather and John Creed and Bias Stanley and William Grimes. That wasn't always the case. That happens to have happened by happenstance, but it's come to the place that I find a wonderful sort of spatial metaphor for us to think about how to do that and make uh, the stones that the builder rejected the, the cornerstone. And finally, we are late to this, and I'm glad that that's been called out and it's been acknowledged by the institution. Um, and so we have to be humble about that. But just because we're late, let's make sure we're not least. And maybe we should do one from column A, one from column B. And uh, UVA has done a great memorial and Jonathan has shared and Deborah and others what the memorialization at Rutgers, we don't have to choose. Maybe we do all that and more. So just because we're late, let's not be least. Well said, and Kimberly, you wanted in on this, go ahead. Sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm always reminded of, um, of, you know, Frederick Douglass that we hear again and again um, that you can't plow a field, right? You can't have crops without plowing a field. You can't have the ocean without um, the roar of the waves. And this is something that I will probably be um, a broken record about is that, um, as I mentioned that class, it was a site of anger, sorrow, all of these things to be processed, right? And that yeah. cannot be forgotten in, in this process that will never end, um, is that there has to be sites for, um, for, for there to be messiness of emotions and um, it can't just be so dispassionately, I hate to say dispassionate, but dispassionately kind of recorded as we have seen over the last um, three days. I mean, many of us, I think, follow this path as we saw, for instance, during the lunch uh, breakout session where the students I feel are, have much more um, freedom to say how angry they are, right? <laughs> when we're all angry, right? Um, yeah. And I think most of us are guided by this work and this um, academic project and research by some anger that we have and displeasure of, of what we um, have witnessed and are uncovering. And so I will continually on campus be the person who is saying, let that be okay. You know, the same thing with let the trauma still be there. Let the let nothing be erased completely um, because all of it sits together. And one last thing I'd like to say um, that I feel that Willie was definitely alluding to, and I say often to my students, um, that as people of color, we live in liminal spaces that are contradictory. And that is something that we have a comfort level with for good or for bad, but it's something that is part of living in this world for us. 
And so these questions that often come up from non-BIPOC people about contradictions, um, it is often a, a surprise to us, <laughs> but that is then on us to um, maybe communicate or train that talent that we have or that, that skill set that we are pretty much born into so that we all can look at all of this information over the last three days and for the next decades um, and be able to sit with some level of comfort and discomfort um, in those contradictions and be able to talk about them instead of trying to resolve them all the time. So that's my last comment. Education is always about comfort and discomfort and perhaps more about discomfort at, at whatever age we reach young people. There's a variety of questions in the Q&A that I'd like to hear James and others on here. And they have to do with, one says, can the university and its current iteration, can a university, in other ones about, can a university now that operates on a corporate model and so on, can, can are universities good agents of this kind of repair is essentially what some people are asking here, or do the universities themselves have to somehow be reformed? Uh, that's a big question. Anybody want to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, universities are not <laughs> Go universities are not good agents, exactly for the reason that the questioners are suggesting. Universities are uh, incredibly conservative institutions. Um, that uh, especially when you start talking about money and res resources um, are often governed by um, individuals who may or may not be participating in this webinar. Uh, I suspect um, that the, you know, if you look at who makes the decisions over how to use the resources at Yale or not, and, or another university, and you look at who participates in webinars like these, you don't have a tremendous amount of overlap um, amongst individuals, um, and which isn't to say that you have none, um, but that's an issue. And so you have a dynamic often where a lot of us are having these conversations, but the people that have the control over the resources that we uh, would seek to use um, are not necessarily listening in quite that way. Having said that, it is my belief that we all have an obligation in whatever area we're trying to make change in this world. We all have an obligation to try to work within the domains that we can influence most directly, within the spaces that we can attempt to control which isn't to say it's gonna be easy and which isn't going to say there's not gonna be resistance. But the place where we have to try to exert our influence are those places that we are a part of, the places to which we are most, most proximate. So what I will never accept is the idea that because there is some kind of entrenched or uh, intransigent or conservative or unwilling structure or force that then I'm not going to participate in the struggle. So I think we need to acknowledge it, we need to name it, we need to be real about how difficult it will be to move beyond lip service. Um, but, but, and this is just yet another of, you know, Kimberly's contradictions when she says we've been living with contradictions, we're born into contradictions. We simultaneously realize that it is difficult to impossible and we struggle, that's the point. So yes, they are conservative and they're hard and we are gonna keep fighting. Beautifully said. Um, uh, Kimberly, forgive me, but uh, Douglas once said, America is its contradictions, all made up of its contradictions. <laughs> Always love that line, dead right. Um, you know, and, and back to Craig's uh, pointing out that we're 20 years into this history and that that 20, at least 20 years. And that 20 years now, interestingly, needs its own history. Craig, we're waiting for you to write it, of course. Um, you know, it, it isn't that long ago, in other words, that even historians, right, Craig, going out and becoming so public with our work, doing public history, 
you know, working on films, working with museums all the time, uh, taking our work to real people, trying to find, well, that is, you know, people outside the academy. Uh, this is a new process and the power of museums has, has expanded enormously in the past 20, 25 years in terms of what they've chosen uh, to engage. Um, I've, I've, got a, I've got a lot of other questions here, folks. Um, people, well, for one thing, people are writing in and saying, gosh, I wish I had known this, or gosh, I wish I had known that, which is good news, always good news. Um, and, you know, lots of other comments and questions about what Yale can do with all of this, whether it's markings on Connecticut Hall or indeed uh, money and reparations. I guess I just want to hear from the rest from the panel, maybe one more time around, if we could. Uh, a final thought, uh, uh, a take home idea. And you've already said some take home ideas to say the least. And I wish I had time to take more notes here, but a take home idea for our audience uh, of what this conference, what this problem has meant. And that is not to suggest that you thank us all. Don't thank anybody here. Uh, go, go for, the, bring the heat as Joyce said about uh, what this is really all about and what we face. Let's go around the horn again. Craig, you want to go first again? <laughs> Gee, thanks, David. I, I, I well, you go. You want to go last, brother? I, know, I thought we were friends. This is uh, <laughs> the uh, look. I, 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 I think if I were um, the thing that gives me pause even now, um, and I'm delighted to see you host this conversation. I was delighted to see, um, you know, uh, David, uh, you bringing this discussion public and forward, and to see President Salovey there. Um, but the thing that gives me pause is I know that for the first decade of the 21st century, we ran away from this discussion. Our institutions ran away from it. They, they silenced it. You know, they, they gave no support to the faculty who were teaching these little classes on you know, Carl Jacoby on Columbia and slavery and Princeton and slavery and Harvard and slavery. They ignored what was happening. They, they ignored the students who were doing the research. Um, you know. And then in the last about five years or so, we've been running toward this topic. Yep. And I suspect that part of that, you know, the cynic in me, and I, I, it believes um, that the last five years, the last 10 years, especially the years of student protest and then the, um, the violent um, explosion of what was always in fact a defining white nationalist sentiment in the United States has actually led us to embrace history, um, but not because we're necessarily in a moment of transformation, but I fear we've embraced history and we've embraced these kinds of projects and we've embraced this moment um, because history is actually easier than the present. Um, if we feared talking about the past in 2006, um, we retreated to talking, to the past, talking about the past in 2016. Um, we didn't want to confront the racial realities of our campuses, um, the gender and um, economic inequities of our institutions. Um, and so talking about the past became much easier than talking about the present. Um, and in the same way that I don't want, you know, when I made my comments, I didn't want African-American history to um, be used to um, evade our obligation to look at the broader network of um, community stories that define these institutions. I also don't want our re-engagement with the past, which I now you know, absolutely celebrate. Um, to allow us to hide from the challenges of the present. And the present moment as that last question sort of um, detailed um, is a deeply undemocratic, a deeply, a frighteningly unjust, horrifically racist, exclusionist, xenophobic moment um, that we need institutions like Yale and MIT and Harvard and Howard and Spelman and, and every public university in the United States to turn their energies in to, toward opposing. Um, and so I don't want us to retreat to the past in order to avoid the present. I want us to use the past to confront the present realities. Uh, well, thank you and beautifully said. I, I just wanna comment that that is the only hint we've had uh, remarkably of the previous presidential administration really in this entire conference, which is uh, to be celebrated in a way. But yes, we are living in a time 
when history came out of its, you know, what, whatever shell it was in, got unshucked and smashed us in the, in the face in the last several years. And lo and behold, it always does. Anyone goes next, but Willie's going last on this, this question. <laughs> uh, who's next? Anyone, go ahead, please. I just want to, I, I just read about um, in the q and I just want to mention, you know, again, about the present um, yeah. and what can be done in, in the Q&A, the, the Yale Prigen Education Initiative is, is oh, yeah. mentioned. I and, yeah. you know, and I find that that was one of the things that brought me back to Yale were these types of programs that are happening and they need to be supported. They need to be um, incredibly important aspects of these types of reparations, right? Um, and addressing the current um, fallout and repercussions of so much history that we just looked at for the last three Kimberly, years. thank you for mentioning that. I'd made a note to mention it. I just heard this afternoon from the director of that prison project here at Yale. And she was saying, David, when are we gonna meet? We gotta get these two projects together. They have a major new Mellon grant for that, but it's, not clear yet how much institutional support they have. That's right. Go yeah. Zelda. <laughs> so glad you brought that up. Uh, who's next? Go ahead, Mike. Anybody? I mean, I want to associate myself with what Dr. Wilder said and, and what the student said and, and what uh, Elizabeth Alexander said in terms of being bold. So, um, cosine. Okay. Uh, so I can, you know, yeah. crack at that one. <laughs> um, so I think one of the the most critical pieces is uh, that UVA absolutely encouraged us to do is to begin to engage the community, and to understand that it's going to be a messy, painful conversation because a lot of the town gown things have been pretty ugly. Um, but that it and it's overdue and it's time. And I just want to recognize that my mentor, Gerald Friedland, put a message into the, um, into the chat in which he asked us to make sure that we address um, inequity in healthcare. And there's inequities in, of housing and education, healthcare in this, in this city um, that uh, the university and the hospital have been complicit in. And it's time that um, that was called out and uh, addressed. And as we've learned, Joy, from the earlier session today, the age of uh, uh, very ugly uh, racist medicine is not that many decades in our past. <laughs> uh, and has its uh, living legacies. Yes, indeed. Uh, James, go ahead. Uh, a, a parting shot here. Yeah, I just want to uh, say that I very much, I said this before, but I really look forward to continuing this conversation um, with a particular focus on uh, the afterlives um, and with a particular focus on the, uh, as Craig Wilder just said, um, having that history um, not as an excuse for not confronting uh, the present, um, but as actually a sort of a reason and a motivation and I just want to say, I think it, it, it needs to be said because there's been so much talk of this 1831 college. And oh. now we just hear the Yale about the Yale Prison Education Initiative and Zelda uh, and her oh, amazing yeah. work that she's doing. Right. But 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 you said with little institutional support, you know, this is so here we go. Here we go. 1831. Mm -hmm. Yale helped to mobilize its resources to eliminate, somebody put in the chat, to murder a potential Black college. And now today, we have professors who are teaching in prisons under, with Zelda Rowland's leadership, and the struggle to get credit, credit for the students who are studying in classes taught by Yale professors and graduate students, those incarcerated men and women need to get credit for the work that they're taking. And so we, these connections are right here. They're right in front of us. So what can Yale do in response? We can't go back to 1831, but how can we not fully 
aggressively with all of our might support a program like the Yale Prison Education Initiative. So there are going to be a lot of speeches that are going to be given, but we really have to hold people to account on this and we have to connect up this history to this right now. Uh, thank you, James. And uh, Willie, a last, uh, a last comment. Thank you, David. I just want to lift off from what Brother James said and what Joy said so powerfully. At this moment, what Yale needs to do, I think most quickly, clearly, immediately, is to make New Haven a full and complete collaborator and partner in the work. For too long, it's obvious, not only at Yale, but so many other universities, that its, its vision of what it's about has not included the very place that it's in. And so its, its moral footprint has not really been a footprint shaped by the place. And I love what Joy and Michael pointed out in their presentations, what they've also pointed out just now. There, there is really no future in, in deepening what we have to do without making the city of New Haven, not just a place that needs to be managed, but a moral and an intellectual partner in the work and allowing the city to help shape the intellectual direction and the project of the university. Across the country, almost every university treats its city as though the city serves it rather than as a conversation, as an intellectual, as a moral partner. And I think for us here at Yale, it's time that we start stop treating New Haven as though New Haven is the backdrop for Yale. <laughs> New Haven and Yale are one project. And until Yale starts to see New Haven as a shared project of education and of the kind of work we want to do in this world, then we'll continue to recreate the very dynamic that was born of slavery and live in its aftermath. Well, thanks, Willie. And I do think uh, there's some good news that uh, President Salove certainly signaled a new initiative with the city the other night. So I'm gonna wrap up now. Yeah, I will. I, I'm getting a reminder from the ever-present Michelle. Um, I just wanna wrap up by saying a couple of quick things. Well, thanks to everybody here. This, God, we could go on for hours about this. Um, James Baldwin once wrote very briefly and simply, I think it was 1961, he said, the problem with the way Americans use words about their history is they use them to cover up the sleeper, but not to wake him up. History is to wake us up, not to make us sleep well. I've always loved that metaphor. Uh, the pleasing history, uh, what, what, it, uh, what it is, feels good to remember uh, helps us sleep. What we ought to remember does not always help us sleep. But I'm actually gonna oddly uh, end with a, a passage from a, a historian at Yale, a great historian at Yale and the long uh, string of them who helped create this field of slavery studies. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's so much like him, this kind of a quiet but poignant quote. This is from Edmund Morgan. In his book, American Slavery, American Freedom, he said, quote, to a large degree, it may be said that Americans bought their independence with slave labor. The paradox is American and it behooves Americans to understand it if they would ever understand themselves. Morgan had that ability in such simple sentences to sort of speak across time. And that is still one of the greatest books that came out of that explosion of the revolution in slavery studies back in the 1970s in this case. And that too is gonna to be part of our study here, our book that will come out of this, which is to try to trace how the field, uh, I mean, we've got a lot to do in this project, but how the field of slavery studies for, for better and for worse, I might mention, uh, evolved here at Yale, uh, from as early as Ulrich Phillips, <laughs> uh, all the way uh, through Morgan, uh, John Blasengame, David Brian Davis, and now many, many, many other people around this campus. Um, 
this has to end sometime. Uh, part of me wishes it wouldn't. Part of me is uh, glad to take a break. <laughs> uh, thank you, Craig, James, Willie, Kim, uh, Joy, and my uh, partner in so much of this now at the Beinecke, Mike Moran, for serving on this final panel. A special thanks to Michelle Zacks and Daniel Vera and Melissa McGrath, who have worked incredibly hard for two solid days across the hall from me, making all of this technology somehow work and communicating with all of you at the same time. And to all of our students, many of whom got to perform on this conference and to all of our participants and, and all of our great audience out there. Thank you to everybody and stay tuned. Uh, much more to come from the Yale and Slavery Project. And within a year, we hope a book. Thanks everybody, take care, have a weekend. <laughs> hey, thanks everybody. Oh, and now the shades, yes. And now the shades. <laughs> oh, pirates, yes they roll by. So that to the merchant ships Whole minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit My hand was made strong By the hand of the Almighty We forward in this generation It's all I ever had Redemption song Redemption song Redemption song Redemption song Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our mind Have no fear for atomic energy Redemption songs, songs of freedom.